Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And today we're going to do just a little bit of a quality of life improvement and show you how easy that is. So going into the archive, you'll remember the British Carriers section was a section I set up quite a while ago. And as you can see, the pictures are fairly small and they're quite cut off. The originals are still there, but if I go into edit section, you'll see a couple of easy changes I can make to make this look a lot better. So instead of insert, I'm going to make it full. I'm going to reduce the number of columns from four to three, and I'm going to change the aspect ratio displayed to widescreen. And you can see immediately the vast majority of the pictures are much improved. They're bigger. You can see what their content is a lot clearer and the ships basically fit. So just save that section move down to the next section and repeat the process. Now, as I said, the pictures in their original format, in their original whatever aspect ratio they happen to be in, they're all still there. If you click on them, open them in a new tab, whatever, you'll see the full picture. But this just makes things so, so much easier to display. And of course, now, just that quickly, literally less than a minute and a half, we've got a much better looking page. And of course, you can use different aspect ratios for different types of photos. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for huh, maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinafel. You can get a free trial. And once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show. There are a lot of aspects that go into the production and functionality of naval armor. I've discussed in a relatively brief format the development of naval armor on a previous video on the channel. However, today I thought we could take a look at one particular principle of naval armor that pretty much defines almost all naval armor in the period the channel covers, right from its inception and deployment aboard Gloire and Warrior in the 1860s through to the end of World War II. And that is a paradox when it comes to the material that you use. At a very shallow surface level, it might seem that clearly the best thing you want to do if you're protecting your ship from gunfire is to cover it in plates of the hardest material you can possibly find, because of course, a hard material is good at resisting incoming fire. That's why armor on people historically was made out of bronze and then it was made out of iron and then it was made out of steel. Rocks, arrows, spears, clubs, maces, swords, pole axes, etc., etc. They all had one thing in common. There was usually a fairly hard, sharp bit at the end that was being poked at the person who was wearing the armor. Now, granted, softer armors did exist. Linothorax, Subarmalis, padded jacks, gambesons, etc. But everybody pretty much re recognized that these were not as good as having a metal breastplate covering your body, although they would often be paired with them. But the problem when it came to cladding ships in hard iron armor initially came actually as the result of a mischance when they were testing not iron armor, but iron hulls. Iron hulled ships preceded iron armored ships by a couple of decades, but initially it looked like you could build a ship that was actually stronger or less weight because the iron would be substantially thinner than the wood, even though it was slightly denser. And in initial testing, it seemed that if a shot passed through the iron hull plating, the same way that a shot close range would pass through the sides of even the thickest wooden warship, it actually seemed to do less damage. The iron would peel back, there would be a small hole, just a fraction larger than the projectile, as opposed to a big gaping hole with lots of splinters, as would be caused by shot passing through a wooden hull. And thus, the overall effect was considerably less, and a small neat hole was much easier to patch as well. Unfortunately, when iron hulled ships then went to sea, they discovered that their plates were cracking quite a bit more than they had done in the tests which was resulting in splinters, much larger entry wounds, which were obviously then much harder to patch up, and potentially the failure of entire plates. Now, why was this? If those of you who've watched the previous armor video will recognize that this was to do with an engineering term called phase shifting. Essentially, a metal 
past a certain temperature going down the scale will become brittle, and above that temperature it will become ductile to a certain degree. Now ductile obviously meaning, in more common parlance, a little bit bendy, i.e. it would bend before it would break, and if it did break, it wouldn't shatter. Now obviously this is a somewhat relative term because some types of iron can be relatively ductile as far as metals go, but if you were to run into a four inch thick plate of iron, it's not going to bend out of your way. You have to hit it with considerably more energy before it starts to behave in a ductile manner on the kind of macro scale that you would notice. This was obviously bad news for iron-hulled ships, and they very quickly were taken off of frontline duties, but when it came to implementing iron as armour, it presented a little bit of a quandary, because generally speaking, a hard, brittle material will need more energy to cause failure than a softer, more ductile material. But then, when that failure point is reached, the failure is far more spectacular and far more destructive. Now, when it comes to armour, that would seem to indicate that a harder, brittle material is better, because obviously you want to keep shot out. A softer, more ductile material, like, say, wood, it might not fail spectacularly in the way that some of the iron plates were, but it would let in pretty much almost any heavy-grade shot you sent at it, which rather defeated the point of it being armour. But at the same time, given that gun technology was evolving relatively quickly in the mid-1800s, you didn't necessarily want to go all in on your hard, brittle armour, which could bounce, say, 32 pounds a cannon shot, if when someone rocked up with a 68 pounder or something even bigger, an entire side of your armour plate fell away. Now, to help us understand how this principle works, I set up a series of tests using a very ductile, relatively soft material, cardboard, and a fairly hard, fairly brittle material, plate glass. And first, we're going to see how things escalate in terms of the resistive properties of the different materials. So first we have our bit of cardboard and we're shooting at it with a gel blaster. And as you can see, the gel pellets come in and they just bounce off the cardboard. So this is illustrating that even a relatively soft ductile material like say wood, if you shoot at it with a relatively low velocity, relatively weak projectile, it will still provide you with a decent amount of protection. There's a little bit of marking, but not a huge amount else. Now, if we switch over to the glass plate, again, the gel pellet comes in and does not penetrate, bounces off as well. So our hard, brittle material is standing up to the same assault. So, so far, so good. Both materials, whether we use wood or iron in the 1860s, they seem to be protecting us equally as well. But what happens if we step it up a notch? Using a somewhat higher velocity 6mm plastic BB, you'll see it punches straight through our, in the 1860s, wood analogue, and there is now a hole. So that's not brilliant. But if we switch over to our iron analogue, our glass plate, well, the shot just bounces off, and in this case, shatters into many, many pieces. So this demonstrates the benefits of using iron in the late 1850s and early 1860s as armour. The kind of shot that would quite easily punch a hole through a wooden ship of the line against an armour plate doesn't do much of anything. It, the armour just rejects the shot and the ship goes on quite happily. That means your gun crews inside are safe, your guns are safe, and of course your water line integrity is also safe. But of course, what if someone invents a harder projectile and sends it a lot faster? Well, if we switch over to a 4mm steel BB from a CO2 rifle, well, shockingly enough, our cardboard just gets punched straight through, slightly smaller hole, not a big surprise, but when we switch over to our iron analogue, the glass, it also gets punched through, but this time, as you can probably see from the high speed there, there is a considerably larger hole than there was when we were firing through the cardboard. Let's take a closer look. You can see here that our brittle material, although stronger, it resisted that 6mm plastic pellet. In this case, when it's failed, 
it has failed considerably more spectacularly. You can see the little hole punched through our softer, more ductile material and the much larger hole and the rather extensive propagating cracks that have been punched through our stronger material now that its limit has been reached. This means that despite us using our harder and theoretically stronger material, there's now a lot more material inside our ship, a lot more splinters, and potentially a lot more access for more shots to come in of any kind, because a gel pellet, a 6mm plastic BB, whatever, could all fit through that hole. And it gets worse, because if we shoot the same plate a second time, and let's face it, ships had lots of guns, another hole is punched, but then there is a complete cascade failure of the plate. And down it goes. This is very, very bad. Because if we shot the cardboard twice, there would be two small holes in the cardboard. It's not ideal for the people immediately behind that, but the rest of the ship is substantially intact. Whereas in this case, our armor plating, which, bear in mind, protected us completely against the lower velocity, slightly softer projectiles, whereas our softer, more ductile material did not, but now has failed so catastrophically that our whole area of our ship is now open to pretty much anything you want to throw at it. It's not going to provide any resistance to our 32 pounder equivalent shot because it's no longer there. It's not even going to provide the limited resistance to our anti-personnel shot simulated by the gel blaster rounds, which the cardboard, the wood analog, still would because it would be you know, just generally there with a few small holes in it, whereas this is completely gone and doesn't even protect you from an angry person with a pistol. You can see how, with a brittle failure, the cracks have propagated. They've actually joined up with a previous impact point, and that's been the end of that. So was there a solution to this conundrum? Well, yes, there was. You can actually see this here in this cut-through section of one of HMS Warrior's bulkheads. On the far right, you can see the 4.5 inches of iron armour, and then in between there and the framing of the hull, you can see there is a bunch of teak, about 18 inches on the side and about that much on the bulkheads as well. Now, what this does is by bonding a softer, more ductile material to a harder, more brittle material, the backing area provides a small amount of additional resistance, but honestly not a huge amount. If a projectile hits hard enough to compromise that outer hard brittle layer, it's probably also going to compromise the inner layer quite easily. But there are two important benefits to doing this. Firstly, a partial penetration, something that causes a lot of spalling off of the back, will have those fragments caught by the backing material so they don't go spraying into the gun deck. But secondly, they also form a support for the harder, brittle material, which firstly, because it absorbs some of the shock, reduces the total amount of failure in the event of a catastrophic failure via penetration, and critically, supports even a shattered plate and holds it in place. So whilst the hole punched by that particular very nasty projectile might have gone through, the rest of the plate is still there, much like how the cardboard was still there after we shot it with the 6mm plastic pellet and the 4mm steel pellet, which means that if you're being fired on by one or two really nasty weapons which can punch through your armour, but there's also a ton of other shell-firing guns, smaller cannon, anti-personnel weapons, etc. Those are still substantially going to be stopped by your armour belt, which means that your ship is going to be in a much better condition than if that whole armour section had just shattered, failed and fallen off, at which point, obviously, then all that other fire could get in easily. But you might say, well, that's all very well as a nice, neat theory, but does that work in practice? Let's face it, wood and iron are still both relatively tough materials, at least hardwood is, and you've been using a relatively pathetic material like cardboard and a very brittle material like glass. Does this principle actually extend even to those materials? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the next step was to take an identical glass plate as I bought them in a pack of three identical plates, and to take another section of cardboard from the same box, and then glue one to the other. 
And yes, in this case, I used glue instead of bolts or welding or any other form of attachment, because guess what? Those particular forms of attachment don't work very well with glass. But the general point of one material supporting the other is borne through. Let's see what happens now. So here's our cardboard and glass analog to, say, HMS Warriors, teak and iron. There goes the steel pellet. And, well, it's punched a hole through, but... If we take a somewhat closer look at the damage, you'll see that not only is the resulting hole in the glass considerably smaller, but also the crack propagation is considerably less, and the glass plate is still there, it hasn't fallen down. Now, you might say, hang on a minute, when you shot the first glass plate, the one that wasn't backed by anything, that stayed up as well. Well, you would be correct. But what happens if we shoot this setup more times? Well, here comes shot two, and it's going to be relatively similarly placed to how the first two shots were placed on the regular glass plate. And look, it's still there. Similar kind of damage inflicted. And already that means that this has succeeded better than just the hard, brittle material on its own, because at this stage things aren't falling down, there's just a little bit of a spray of glass. But then here comes a third shot, and it continues to remain intact, although the damage done by this shot, as you can see, the hole punch is a little bit larger. Then there's a fourth, and then finally, for the sake of this test, mainly because obviously I have to clean up all this powdered glass afterwards, in will come a fifth shot. And that's going to aim in the middle of these other four because that's going to give the maximum chance of failure by grouping them all relatively close together. There we go. Right between shots one and shots four. But as you can see, there's more outblown glass, but the plate is still there. So if I was to take the gel blaster or the plastic pellet rifle, that would still bounce off the vast, vast, vast majority of this, unless I have to get really lucky and get a shot straight through one of these holes. And here you can see those impacts in a bit more detail and a bit closer up. So whilst in some areas where, as you can see, the glue wasn't completely 100% covering, there was slightly more damage to the glass plate, and that being the top two mainly, and there's a fairly extensive amount of crack propagation. The thing is, this armor plate, if you like, is still there. And again, if I were to shoot it with the less powerful rounds, it would still provide resistance to those. And even the biggest hole that's been punched here is still nowhere near the size of the first hole that was punched in the plate glass just on its own. So the damage to the armor part portion of the plate, as opposed to the backing absorbing portion of this setup, is still reduced. And this principle would go on throughout armor development, as we've just done our analog test here, roughly representing wood and iron plating, as you would find in the 1860s. But as time went on and materials got more and more advanced, you had the development of compound armor, which you can see here. Now, with compound armor, you would have an even harder material than the iron, that being steel, on the outer face. But steel faced the same problems that iron had in the past when it w was subject to that phase transition we talked about, and it could shatter. So they backed the steel with a softer, more ductile material than the steel, that being iron, and you get compound armor, which you can see here is on HMS Colossus. And they actually kept the teak backing as a third layer just to improve things still further. For a brief period after compound armor, it seemed as though a new type of steel, which promised to be stronger than iron, but still retain a portion of its ductility, might allow for a single homogeneous piece of protection. But very rapidly, guns overcame that. And then you've got the development of Harvey armor. Now, Harvey armor essentially took the principle of iron and wood or compound armor with steel and iron and blended it into a single material whereas these previous plates had had two distinct materials that were then bonded in some way with harvey steel it was a single piece of steel that started off somewhat softer and more ductile but then as per the process explained in my previous video on armor had its face hardened 
and that gave you a material that had a hard, brittle outer layer and a soft, ductile inner layer with much less risk of failure between the two plates because there weren't two plates anymore. There wasn't a weld or a bolt in the way. It was just a transition of properties within the same material. And then, of course, Krupp steel came along and that was even better at that kind of job than Harvey steel was. And Krupp steel would then be improved upon in various iterations through World War I and World War II. But essentially, the principles established in the late 1890s remained the same with subtle variations on the thickness of the harder outer faceplate and the exact materials that you used beyond just iron and carbon to make the steel. Interestingly, although the effect was now contained within the armour plate itself, a wooden backing to the armour plate, mostly for catching spall, remained in a surprising number of warships into the early 20th century. There are pictures, for example, of Tiger on her launch where you can clearly see large patches of teak in the area where her armour belt is about to be fitted. So that wraps up this brief presentation looking at one specific aspect of the general behaviour of armour plate between 1860 and 1950 and answering of course the question why didn't people just go for massive thick slabs of the hardest metal that they could get their hands on at the time whether that be hammered iron, rolled iron, chilled iron, Crusoe steel or later on hardened nickel steels. It's because of the different properties of brittle and ductile materials and how they react to a high speed impact. And thus a combination of the two actually can give a better result than just a single monolithic thickness of either one. So if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing popping up on the occasional Friday, let us know in the comments below and then next year maybe I'll do some more practical investigations into the properties of materials used in battleship construction and why they were used in the way that they were. Bye for now.